said, I've been in practice about 25 years and um, come all the way here from Charleston to share with you some things I've learned over the last few years from some really, really bright people. Uh, I'll introduce you to Dr. Vajdani in just a couple slides, but I think the one thing I'd like to start with is the incredible title you see up on the, on the board, Predict, Prevent, Prevail, over something as incredibly serious as CTE, Chronic Traumatic Encephalopathy. I would like to share with you over the next couple of hours how we found out we can predict it, along with many other autoimmune conditions. How we can prevent it, because you want to go home with some take home opportunities to fix people, obviously that's why you're here, and then ultimately to prevail over something as terrible as CTE, starting with the traumatic brain injury. This is obviously traumatic brain injury. And I'd like to first tell you that I'm not gonna be talking too much about moderate or severe, because those are ER type things. What we specialize in are mild traumatic brain injuries. And I was taught a couple years ago not to call any concussion a mild concussion because they're all very serious. Traumatic brain injuries can be mild. Those are the concussions. The other thing I'd like to start with is to tell you that we notoriously chase symptoms. And today I want to share with you the fact that the symptoms aren't nearly as important as the causes. The causes behind those symptoms. So if you can list off in your mind right now a half a dozen, 10, 12 symptoms that will be related to a concussion. Loss of concentration, nausea, vomiting, dizziness, the vertigos, all of the, the eye movement disorders, anything that you can think of right now that would be a symptom or a sign of a concussion has a cause. And it's not the concussion. It's what happened immediately after. And it's what goes on for hours, days, weeks, months, and even years in post-concussion syndrome. This is what I'd like to share with you today as much as I possibly can in, I think they said, an hour and 40 minutes. So I'll be quick. And if you have any questions, I'll try and answer them on the spot. But probably be easier if we just talk afterwards. And that way we could... I could explain things more elaborately, but definitely um, feel free to ask. As I mentioned, Dr. Vajdani, I met with him a couple of years ago when I learned about his blood test. Yes, there is a blood test that can definitively and objectively diagnose a concussion. It can actually confirm the diagnosis. Most concussions are diagnosed sideline by a trainer maybe by the team physician. I mean, you can almost diagnose it from your TV set while you're watching a football game. But there's not been much in the way, unless you guys know of some equipment that you're using in optometry, that can objectively and definitively confirm the diagnosis. What Dr. Bajdani did in 2015 was patented a blood test. The blood test that he patented detects blood-brain barrier disruption. And I'm going to teach you about the blood-brain barrier in just a moment. But the fact that he was able to take the research, write his own paper, and then follow up with that so that he could create a working test, an immunoassay, that can tell us when the blood-brain barrier has been disrupted. And I like to say the more important aspect behind that whole idea isn't so much to confirm the diagnosis of the concussion, because there's a few of the blood tests out there that can do that. I'll talk about those in a moment. To me, the more important question to be answered is when the blood-brain barrier has not been disrupted any longer, when it's healed. Literally, that's what we tell the players, the, the coaches, the trainers, anyone who's been involved with a concussion who wants to return to play or return to activity. Knowing when to go back is the essential big question. You'll hear about the players in concussion protocol. Oh, maybe he'll be back next week, we're not sure. Dr. Vajdani made us sure. So I love the fact that he went to that next level. Of course, he's only got about 45 or 50 years of experience in designing immunoassays. He's got, I want to say, over 300 his credit, uh, 30 that are patented. As a matter of fact, I've read the patent on this blood test. It hurt my head, but I felt it necessary to read it. And I've actually challenged a few people, have you ever read the patent on the tool that you use the most every day in your office? Even my barber, I said, you ever read the patent on those clippers? And he said, no. He said, well, not that you have to, 
but I think it's important to know everything about everything that you can when you're practicing or working. Blood-brain barrier, what the heck is it? Now, this is advanced, so I'm sure you guys don't need an anatomy lesson, especially not 8 o'clock in the morning. But the blood-brain barrier, quite simply, is that 400 miles or so of veins, arteries, and blood flow throughout the brain. It's throughout the brain. A lot of people, when I first talk about it, they think, well, okay, we've got hair, skin, skull, and then somewhere under there's brain. The blood flow isn't on the outside, it's all throughout. And the barrier is that separation between general blood flow that's bringing nutrients to the brain and taking the toxins away from the brain after they've, they've been utilized and putting it back into blood flow. The important thing about this blood-brain barrier is the fact that it is a barrier, just like the intestinal barrier and lung barrier. It's essential that only specific things get into and out of that brain. In the event of a traumatic brain injury, the blood-brain barrier is disrupted. Once there is disruption, these comp particular components, particularly the actin, microtubulin, S100B, which is a component of the astrocytic foot process. You see the astrocyte, the foot processes make up about 90% of the blood-brain barrier. Only a small component of the barrier is the barrier itself because it's so tiny. It can only allow things less than 400 dacon into the brain. If it's disrupted, larger molecules go in, things we don't want in there, and then you'll have a, an activation of the microglial cells and some other things that go on inside the brain, I will explain later. But this being the blood-brain barrier anatomy helps you kind of get a visualization of where everything is. Now, if you look, I don't know if this is going to work or not. Yeah, it does. Good. This would be the brain out here. You've got your blood flow in here, there, and that would represent the neuron going to and attaching outside of that blood-brain barrier right here. So if this is disrupted, these guys get in. We don't want that. Yeah.